You're listening to a podcast from the South China Morning Post. Hello, this is Jared Watt, the producer of the podcast. This week, Finbar and the team are talking about Taiwan. Now, recent U.S. diplomatic visits to Taipei have angered Beijing, which considers the self-ruled island part of the Chinese mainland's sovereign territory, and that any American overtures are meddling in domestic affairs. Now, as Finbar says, on with the show. Hello and welcome to the China Geopolitics podcast with me, Finbar Birmingham, the Europe correspondent at the South China Morning Post. It's been a week of escalation in the Taiwan Strait, with Joe Biden dispatching an unofficial delegation to Taipei to meet with the government in the sign of his support for expanding the relationship. At the same time, China has warned once again that this is a red line. Military buildups and incursions in airspace are becoming the order of the day. It's a worrying situation. Who will blink first? John Carter and Joe Shin will be here to discuss the historical significance of Xi Jinping's aims to reunify China, as well as the economic angle at play. Taiwan is the world's most important producer of semiconductors. We've also seen economic data for the first quarter of this year out of Beijing on Friday morning. John is going to talk us through that in his usual forensic detail. Then in the second part of the show, we're going to be talking Belt and Road Gone Wrong with Matej Shemalczyk, the executive director. Director of the Central European Institute of Asian Studies based in Bratislava, Slovakia. This week, again, we saw top officials from the tiny Western Balkan nation of Montenegro, not yet an EU member, but a prospective one, go cap in hand to the European Union to ask for a bailout on a near billion dollar loan it received from Chinese lenders back in 2014. This is to build the first stage of a highway but the EU has said no way, with an estimated cost of 23.8 million US dollars per kilometre. The highway is thought to be among the most expensive stretches of road in the world. It's not even finished yet. The first repayment is due in July, and we're going to discuss a worrying debt pileup potentially on the EU's Balkan border and how Brussels views China's efforts to grow its influence in this part of Europe. Let's get on with the show. Joined as usual by political economy editors John Carter and Joe Shane to discuss the week's events. And there really is only one place to start this week, and that's in Taiwan. Uh, just a quick run through some of the headlines we've had in what has been a really busy week with regard to this situation. US President Joe Biden dispatched an unofficial delegation to Taiwan on Tuesday in what has been seen as an aggressive show of force towards Taipei. They will meet with senior Taiwanese officials at Biden's request. Um, These are long-term friends of Biden and senior statesmen who are also close with Taiwan. We also had a story this week from the Financial Times, this one, that Japan's President uh, Suga is in the White House this week to meet with Joe Biden, where he will be pressured to make a joint statement on Taiwan uh, in response to rising Chinese aggression in the Indo-Pacific. Combined with that, the military aspect of what we've seen this week, the Chinese People's Liberation Army flew 25 warplanes into Taiwan's air defense identification zone on Monday. This is the largest incursion yet. We also have seen on Thursday Chinese military beginning live fire drills in waters off Taiwan's southwest coast. Um, John, This is um, a bit of a a dangerous and perilous situation. We've obviously seen uh, tensions flare uh, from time to time in the region over the past few years. Where do you rank this in terms of, of, you know, its scale? Well, it's a bit difficult to say yet. Uh, You recall that uh, in previous presidents, the Chinese um, government has tested them. You remember that the uh, observation plane that was shot down in the early days of George W. Bush's uh, administration and, and the uh, the pilots and the other airmen that from that plane were held on Hainan Island for a couple of weeks before they were released. That was in the very early days of that administration. And maybe this is the same testing that's going on. Um, the uh, a ta- Taipei newspaper reported that the uh, Chinese have incurred in uh, Taiwanese airspace in 86 of the 104 days so far this year up till Wednesday when, the, you, as you said, they had the largest incursion yet. And so this is China, China testing the limits and whether they go farther or not remains to be seen. But uh, uh, the Biden administration is pushing back. Mm-hmm. You recall last Sunday, 
Blinken made very clear that there would be consequences if China were to attack Taiwan. He didn't say what the consequences would be, but it, at the time I thought it was a fairly unusual statement by Blinken to come right out and say, now hang on, China, wait a minute and, and think about what you're doing. And maybe they thought they knew something or maybe they thought they needed to warn China before it went too far. Uh, because it's not just the Taiwan issue. You've got the issue with the Philippines, South China Sea, the East China Sea with Japan, a number of issues simultaneously. And so now Biden has sent a special delegation headed by former uh, U.S. Senator Chris Dodd and two deputy secretaries of state. So while it's a, technically an unofficial delegation, it has two government officials in it uh, as headliners. So uh, it's Biden sending a clear message. We are friends with Taipei and with Taiwan. And if China were to attack, we would respond in some way. How and in what measure uh, remains to be seen? Yeah, it's interesting because you mentioned the previous tests that Beijing has made of uh, previous U.S. administrations. Um, I mean, I don't think we've seen a situation where both sides have been engaging in such brinkmanship, certainly not uh, in, in, in recent memory. Um, there was also something I might add, the viral uh, photographs that were doing the rounds of uh, U.S. Uh, sea and a Navy captain with his feet up uh, saying yes. he's watching uh, a Chinese naval very vessel. Very popular pictures, yes. Right, yeah. and, and, you know, we're watching you. And, and, and it was, again, and it was by design. The U.S. Navy did this by design. Mm. Uh, it's called cognitive warfare. It's we know what you're doing. We're watching you. So be careful. Careful is uh, an important word. You know, it, it does seem as though this is brinkmanship, Joshin. Um, you know, it's both sides ratcheting up the pressure. Um, this is the sort of thing that could quite easily spiral out of anyone's control. Oh, yes, Fingba. I think for China's perspective, uh, China is trying, uh, you know, uni reunification with Taiwan is something that cannot be negotiated. You know, uh, China dream, including a complete uh, uh, China, at least from the Chinese government's perspective. So when President Xi Jinping or any Chinese leader is going to announce, declare that China has achieved its uh, national rejuvenation, you know, China cannot uh, being afford seeing the mainland and Taiwan are still separated. How can you call a great nation when your country are still separated? And this is a this is a um, this is strategic direction. So that's why I think the Chinese government, for all these decades, you know, never promised that they will give up uh, force as a means to reunify with Taiwan. Uh, it's still kind of uh, mentality is we will do it, you know, at whatever cost. So this is a kind of choice. Uh, strategic choice and it's not uh, to be easily swayed by one demonstration uh, or one leader and uh, as, as john said you know uh, there has been uh, flashpoints uh, many times over the taiwan straits but every time it's uh, um, kind of solved uh, peacefully uh, the last time you know when, when it seems that uh, the cross-strait war is going to happen is was in 1996 but we also have to remember i mean by that time China's military power was dwarfed by the U.S. Uh, military presence in the region. You know, five years after the first Gulf War, you know, China's navy was saying it's compared to the U.S. ones. You know, it's it's from a different, basically from a different century. So China has no uh, capabilities of having this uh, conflict or rivalry against the United States. But today is different. I mean, if you look at, as John mentioned, you know, you look if you look at the Chinese. Uh, military aircraft. If you look at these cruises, you know, China is to give the impression, you know, we can do it, you know, at any moment, at any day. You know, it's just uh, uh, by our own choice. If 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 we want to take Taiwan back or attack Taiwan today, we can start it and finish the war within like forty eight hours. And they want mm -hmm. to have this kind of uh, um, uh, uh, impression also for the for the United States. And, and for sure, like one important factor deciding the timing of China's uh, uh, action will be, you know, uh, the Washington's determination, how committed uh, Washington is in protecting Taiwan. So if, I mean, for China, if the uh, U.S. also have an all-out war against China, maybe the cost is a little bit too heavy. But if the U.S. saying this is just another regional battle and we just engage and then quickly retreat, and then this is something that China can, you know, can swallow. So, yeah. uh, so... Uh, but 
at the end of the day, I don't think there will be eminent, I mean, uh, risks of war because for both sides, they think time is on their side. For China, uh, President Xi Jinping already says the momentum and t- time is on China's side. China will only become stronger. The relative, uh, you know, a gap with Taiwan will be wider economic, military. Uh, so China can wait. You know, China can mm-hmm. wait for another five, ten years, no problem. But yeah. for the uh, yeah, for the United States, of course, there was no need to provoke, you know, Taiwan to to start any uh, to declare any formal. Uh, independence to 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 start a war in the Taiwan Strait. So uh, for for now, I think the risks are still manageable. There's been a lot of talk, Joe Shin, over the last few years about how um, Xi Jinping's elevation to you know uh, Deng Xiaoping level of um, in terms of eminence as a Chinese leader, Mao Zedong, um, and a lot of people say that maybe in order to elevate himself to that you know upper echelon particularly with Mao it would take the reunification of of Taiwan with mainland China I just wonder if you could maybe explain a little bit about that point of view coupled with the fact that this is the 100th this year is the 100th anniversary of the the Communist Party and how those historical and perhaps symbolic factors are playing into the situation with Taiwan Okay, uh, Fingma, if you go this way, I, I suggest you go a little bit longer even. Throughout China's thousands of years of history, all those names will be remembered as the great emperors or great generals. You know, for whoever can unify the uh, whole country and, this, and the same heaven will be remembered. But by that, that said, th- that doesn't mean that there will be, uh, you know, there will be a uh, uh, rush or there will be reckless actions from Beijing to do, to do this. The 100th anniversary of the Communist Party is uh, more of like building up domestic consensus, rallying, rallying the whole country, the whole party, you know, on the same on the same page about that China is on the right path, China is on the right side of history. The time and the momentum is on China's side. Also, remember, Fingba, you know, for this uh, uh, for this 100th anniversary of the Communist Party, there is clearly there is no military parade in front of the Tiananmen Square. So China wants to project this image that 100 years after, you know, the Communist Party is still a peace-loving uh, party, political force, and it is not uh, trying to threaten the word peace, uh, word development. And uh, for Taiwan, it is, a, it is a sovereignty issue that the Communist Party has to solve. But uh, the Chinese co- Communist Party is not, uh, you know, going to any war like very easily. So this is a this is a message. I think for this year, mm-hmm. at least, I um, I don't think there's any possibility that there will be uh, a big military conflict over the Taiwan Strait. Yeah, there's a, of course economic factors here. Um, China is trying to work its way up the value chain. Tech, value chain technologically, uh, Taiwan, one of the biggest chip makers in the world. Um, the United States at the moment is is on a chip making drive, pumping billions of dollars into its own domestic industry. Um, John, can I maybe ask you a little bit about how that um, supply chain factor plays into this and how important Taiwan is in the global supply chain there? Well, TSMC is the premier um, chip maker in the world. Uh, they have the, the best, highest quality chips. And um, uh, it would be difficult to imagine the world doing without TSMC at this point. I mean, there are the competitors are Samsung and South Korea. Um, but uh, you may have noticed uh, this week uh, the, the Biden administration uh, banned uh, work with uh, seven entities related to Chinese supercomputing. And within days, TSMC canceled orders to supply chips to those entities. And so TSMC is working with in U.S. Um, political parameters, and uh, this will not make Beijing happy. Um, so you could make an argument that's one reason for Beijing to invade is to get um, TSMC's technology. Um, but it, it is an important. I mean, as you know, China is trying to imp- move up its value chain to be uh, uh, independent in uh, chip making and other high tech products uh, because it's uh, badly dependent on the US on the west mm-hmm. now um, and uh, that's where taiwan is kind of in the middle on the one hand they do supply a lot of um, technology to the mainland there are lots of connections business wise between taiwan and in china on the other hand, it leans towards the United States because the United States is the unofficial protector of Taiwan. And so 
uh, they're caught in the middle, and uh, the whole chip episode is an example of this. Joe Shin, I bring you in on this. Uh, how, how how strategically important do you see that technological and the the, the, the sort of innovation element of this story? Uh, well, I think uh, John mentioned a very interesting series that China has one more reason to attack Taiwan because uh, TSMC. But uh, for there's a different view that you know TSM, the existence of TSMC is actually one reason for China will not rush to uh, uh, attack Taiwan because uh, TSMC, as uh, John just mentioned, is uh, critically important for for producing basically all the advanced chips uh, for for not only the region but also for for the whole world. So uh, many, uh, you know, before Huawei was uh, uh, sanctioned by the U.S. before the last August, you know, Huawei can design chips, but the production is made in the in the fab in the in the foundry at TSMC. So it is uh, it is very very important for China's uh, semiconductor industry as well, and it, and you know, uh, China. Mainland China and Taiwan have all those kind of close uh, economic relations. And if you look at the SMIC, you know, China's best uh, uh, chip manufacturer, although it is being blacklisted by, uh, uh, by the United States, but uh, its key executives, its key uh, researchers are from, uh, are from Taiwan. And they are the former executives of uh, TSMC. You can, you can see from this example that China actually can uh, learn a lot and gain a lot from uh, uh, prosperous or booming uh, semiconductor manufacturing business in Taiwan. So, uh, yeah. yes. So, um, But at the end of the day, as you also uh, know, you know, uh, Biden has, uh, uh, this week, has basically conducted a meeting with uh, all these uh, 19 uh, semiconductors uh, executives as well as uh, auto, automakers you know, to talk about this uh, chip shortage. Apparently, everyone is seeing that TSMC, TSMC uh, as a company has been to, you know, the, the burdens or the responsibilities on this one single company is just so big that it's almost that have affected the global, the security or yeah. the sustainability of the global value chain. So everyone, every country, in, including China, the United States, uh, even the European Union, they, they try to say, okay, this is, a, this is not a very stable way. So we have to build up you know, fabs as well on the American soil, uh, within Europe, uh, uh, within Chinese territory. So that reliance on TSMC can be reduced a little bit. But these kinds of projects, these kind of uh, uh, plants are so expensive to, to, to build. I mean, so, so and they also take a long, long period, at least several years for this uh, plant can actually be, you know, Produce produce any chips. So for the time being, or at least in the next one or two years, the uh, importance of TSMC on the uh, landscape of global semiconductor industry will only become more important, not less important. Uh, you know, so anything anything happened around the TSMC would have uh, had a ripple effect on the whole global uh, uh, industry. Yeah. For instance, if there's a blackout. And then it's on uh, uh, headlines of all the industrial websites because, you know, uh, a blackout at the CSMC is huge or there's a drought or there's a flood. So everything uh, happened at the CMC will have kind of repercussions or, or implications for the, for, for, for the whole world. So this is, a, this is, this is a, a, you know, um, the anecdotes, uh, the, mm -hmm. these anecdotes are going to show how important TSMC is at the moment. Yeah, this is why they call it the most important company in the world. Um, we're going to be hearing a lot more about this in the future. Just to close out this part of the show, John, I wanted to ask you about the economic data, which has just come out this Friday morning. Uh, we've seen a record year-on-year -year quarterly growth in the Chinese economy, 18.3% compared to the first three months of 2020. That doesn't really tell the full story, though, does it, John? No, it doesn't. Uh, the 18.3% uh, growth figure is uh, compared to the first quarter of 2020 when growth contracted by 6.8%. So it's skewed by that low base. M many analysts are focusing on the quarter over quarter growth rate to see what's re really going on in the economy. And that slowed from a revised 3.2% growth rate in the fourth quarter to only 0.6% in the first quarter. Number of reasons for this, we had the spike in coronavirus infections in northern China. We had unseasonably cold weather. We, of course, have the Lunar New Year, which even seasonal adjustment factors never fully account for. So 
the zero points, there's reason to believe the zero point six is a bit understated, but still it it that is what's going on is the economy slowed in the first quarter. And so the question then becomes what come goes on from here. So men, some economists think that the growth will rebound in the second quarter uh, based on what they see happening in March alone. Uh, but others are saying, okay, now growth is leveling off. It's rebounded to its pre-coronavirus level, but it, the growth rate is starting to level off and will slowly taper off as the year progresses. Um, and some even believe that Chinese growth will fall below the U.S. growth rate starting in the third quarter. So yeah. we're looking at a gradual de decline for a couple of reasons for this. First, um, China is clamping down on lending to the property sector, uh, one to control housing prices, another just to cool things off a bit uh, because they're very concerned and have been for some time about high debt. Uh, the other reason is uh, the, the, the government wants to taper off its economic stimulus that it put in place a year ago in response to the virus. Uh, so the, uh, the PBOC, the central bank, is likely to uh, not add as much liquidity to the economy going forward, forward as it has before. And we already know, based on the figures that were announced in March from the National People's Congress, that fiscal spending, uh, in other words, government spending on uh, various projects, will be lower this year than it was last year. Not massively lower, but still lower. With the idea, let's gradually reduce this extra help we've been giving the economy up to now. So we'll see. Uh, to remind, uh, the government's growth target for the year is over 6%, quote unquote. Now, just about everybody and his brother is forecasting that growth will be above 8%. And even some economists today, based on the first quarter data, are revising up their growth forecasts uh, uh, to higher above 8%. So most forecasts now are between 8 and 9%. For instance, the IMF is at 8.4% for this year. Uh, but again, that's based in part on a very strong early part of the year with a slight gradual uh, tapering off uh, through the year with the growth rate perhaps falling to the six, 5 or 6% uh, annualized rate by the end of the year. Yeah. John, can I just ask you the difference between what the United States is doing in terms of the unbelievable levels of stimulus they're pumping into the economy and what China's done? Um, just maybe for the listeners who haven't heard you discuss this before, why hasn't China gone uh, as, you know, all guns blazing as the U.S. has? Is it, is it a product of the the this sort of res their respective viral situations? Um, is it a product of China being more confident in the underlying economic situation? Yes, to both of those. I mean, they were first off off the square to get coronavirus under control. Um, they were first to have the pandemic hit them. Uh, and so their recovery started earlier. And because they really clamped down early on uh, the lockdowns in many places in China, uh, the, their economy rebounded uh, faster than expected. And so they didn't need as much stimulus. And uh, you, as you've reported, the trade figures have been astoundingly good in part because Europe and America are importing a lot of stuff from China related to the coronavirus, uh, personal protect, protection equipment related to fighting the virus, as well as work from home equipment like uh, computers or uh, home stereos or what have you. Um, that is likely to taper off. Another reason to expect slower Chinese growth going forward because uh, the U.S. is getting back on its feet now and hopefully Europe will too. And so they'll, their production will rise and won't need as many Chinese in, uh, imports. But to go back to your question, the U.S. is lagging uh, China in economic recovery. Uh, the U.S. has not done a nearly as good a job in controlling the virus as China has, and so it needs more economic stimulus. Plus, there's a, obviously a political dimension to U.S. stimulus plans. Uh, uh, the thinking in the Democratic Party uh, of Biden and his aides is that one of the mistakes that uh, President Obama made after the global financial crisis was not 
going bigger in terms of economic stimulus. And the Democrats got crushed in the first by-election after Obama became president. And part of that, they believe, was because there wasn't enough economic stimulus to make people feel good about the economy. And so yeah. voters blamed the Democrats and voted them out of office. And so this time, they're going big. They're going real big. I mean, you've had... Uh, I mean, in December, you had the uh, $900 billion stimulus, and then you had the uh, the, the uh, more than $2 trillion stimulus uh, er, so far this year. And then now you have uh, Biden's uh, new uh, infrastructure program with uh, a couple trillion dollars more in stimulus. So all of this is going to goose the U.S. economy. And as I say, many expect uh, U.S. growth to exceed that of China starting later this year for a, a period of time. I think over the longer period, China's gro Chinese growth will still exceed U.S., but less so than it has in the past. Interesting stuff. We'll wait and see how this plays out. Uh, Europe that definitely doesn't seem to be anywhere near the scale of, of the United States in terms of stimulus and definitely <laughs> nowhere near China in terms of recovery either. So it seems to be falling between the craps, cracks of the of the two. Indeed. They, they are talking about doing more and you saw the European Central Bank uh, increased its monetary stimulus, but uh, the, the fiscal stimulus from Europe has been tied up in bureaucracy and really hasn't gotten off the ground. And as you say, their vaccine rollout program has just been uh, just inundated with problems. And, the, and so the virus is still a big, big issue. Their lockdowns still exist. Um, and it's going to be a while, maybe next year, before they really get off the ground. It's a terrifying thought, but but uh, fascinating as ever. John Carter, Joe Shin, thanks a million for joining us today. As critical news stories emerging from China continue to shape lives and business around the world, the weekly SCMP Global Impact Newsletter brings you expert analyses and insights on the economics of COVID-19, society, technology, and the environment. Sign up to receive your weekly email at scmp.com slash newsletters. Joined on the line from Slovakia by Matej Szymalczyk, who is the Executive Director of the Central European Institute of Asian Studies. Matej, thanks so much for, for joining us on the show. We're here to talk specifically about a highway in Montenegro. It's quite niche, but the big picture is very important indeed. Just as a bit of background, a $944 million loan in 2014 to the previous Montenegrin government from, from, from the China Exim Bank, one of the big policy banks in Beijing, uh, was was given out to, to be um, to, to a road project to be built by a Chinese company, only the first stage of the road project, not even the full thing. Uh, this highway will eventually link the Adriatic with the Serbian border. Now, this caused headlines this week because not for the first time, a senior cabinet a, a member from Podgorica in Montenegro asked for the EU's help in repaying the debt to China. The EU has said no. It said it does not repay loans of partners which they took from third parties. Matej, it's a bit of a mess here on the EU's borders. Uh, when we were discussing this earlier in the week, you, you explained to me how this puts the European Union in a little bit of a lose-lose situation. How do you see this? What, what, what are the EU's options and, you know, which is the, which is the least worse? Thanks for having me on the show. Um, the situation we are discussing in Montenegro, it's really uh, quite difficult for the EU. Um, because if you look on the face of the things, we see that uh, Montenegro, which is one of the prime uh, candidate countries for future EU membership in the Western Balkans, is facing a heavy uh, debt burden from, from a Chinese policy bank, which it is unable to repay. Uh, Montenegro government, and that's the government uh, that is not, no longer in power, uh, took on this loan despite previous warnings uh, from European institutions that the project, project for the highway construction is not feasible, that there were uh, two feasibility studies by uh, two European uh, policy banks that found that the project is not economically sustainable. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, Montenegro government decided to go with it and uh, took a loan from China to, to construct the highway. Um, now, with, uh, when uh, the EU is uh, facing this request for helping to pay the loan, uh, it has basically two options. None of those are particularly good for the EU. 
the first one is to not help uh, Montenegro, which is uh, where the discussion seems to be heading for now. Uh, and that would uh, leave EU with the possibility of having a bankrupt state directly on, it, on its borders and uh, actually a state that was the closest towards uh, the membership of the EU from the host of uh, Western Balkan countries. Yeah. Uh, also, it would provide uh, EU with a very bad messaging towards the Balkan countries, uh, which are already kind of fatigued with these ongoing uh, long-term discussions about prospects of membership We're not really going anywhere. Um, and not and EU not uh, will not willing to help them uh, would only reinforce this image that membership is something that's not really going to happen uh, anytime soon, and that could drive them further into the arms of of China or Russia or any other uh, power that's willing to uh, meet their uh, financing uh, needs uh, and infrastructure needs as well. Um, yeah. The other option, which is not really particularly good either, is uh, actually helping Montenegro, which uh, would uh, probably help EU to secure better um, visibility in the country and in the rest of the Balkans. Nevertheless, it would also send the very uh, troubling message to the other countries that uh, EU is willing to step in in cases whenever they take on uh, risky loans uh, from China and uh, it might uh, reinforms, reinforce this kind of uh, behavior towards the future when they see that um, there are no uh, possible, no, no, not really any big uh, ramifications for them as others would help out if uh, things uh, turn sour. Yeah. So there's, I mean, those are not great, uh, not a great hand, uh, you know, deck of cards that the European Union has to work with. I want to ask about the, the the broader situation with China here. Um, you know, there there are accusations of debt trap diplomacy in China's defence. The embassy in Montenegro this week pointed out that the loan has a, a interest rate of two percent. Um, but as we've mentioned in the introduction to the show, this is one of the most expensive stretches of road in the world, regardless of the interest rate. I think it's the size of the loan, perhaps, rather than the interest rate, which is the real crippling aspect for Montenegro. Is this an example of um, perhaps a previous government being more friendly towards China and the new government not being along those lines? Um, how much blame do you apportion to China um, for giving this loan, perhaps for a project which maybe should not have happened in the first place, how much uh, blame should you apportion to the previous government in, in Montenegro? And, you know, uh, China obviously gets a lot of flack for these sorts of things, but, I mean, it certainly takes two to tango. It indeed takes uh, two to tango, and the Montenegro government is really bearing a bulk of the blame because it's not like they were not warned uh, previously <clears throat> that the project is not feasible and they decided to go with it uh, anyway. Uh, at the same time, China bears some of that responsibility as well, because if it wants to posit itself as a responsible stakeholder in international affairs and international mm -hmm. development, it uh, should not be going around uh, supporting this kind of uh, project. Uh, it shows also another interesting dynamic uh, that uh, China is really trying to play the role of the plan B for uh, countries in the Western Balkans uh, when they are unable to secure uh, financing from uh, Western uh, financial financing institutions and it's willing to take on this kind of uh, risky project. Uh, it might be interesting to look forward in the future whether China has learned from this episode as well mm -hmm. as others uh, around the world because certainly uh, when these projects um, run uh, come into these problems it does not create very good uh, optics for China as well. Uh, and it can also have ramifications for China in the Western mm -hmm. Balkans, because if you look on, um, at these warnings that uh, were issued towards uh, recipient countries in the Balkans, the risks were, uh, I think, for most stakeholders, quite abstract, because there wasn't really a clear case uh, where they would manifest in the region uh, before. Now we have first such, such case in the Montenegro and the things are not looking very well for Montenegro. Mm. Uh, so it may be this kind of uh, turning point for some countries in the Western Balkans to think more about the potential risks of uh, accepting uh, loans uh, from China. And uh, maybe they will change their negotiating strategies via these loans or try to uh, work with uh, other uh, financing institutions as well, just uh, for mm -hmm. the sake of diversifying their options. 
Sure. China has been quite successful in building a relationship with Serbia, uh, neighbouring Montenegro. Um, Obviously, during the pandemic, we've really seen this come to the fore with the provision of PPE, masks, so on, testing kits, all the rest. And now in this latest stage of the pandemic, we've seen uh, Serbia be, you know, very, very supportive of the use of of Chinese vaccines. Um, You know, they they have been, as I understand it, opening their borders to people from neighbouring countries, including Montenegro, to to, to come into Serbia and giving out vaccines for free, including Sinopharm, the the Chinese vaccine. Um, How important is that Serbian-Chinese relationship and understanding the dynamic of of China in the the Balkans in general, uh, Matej? The Serbian case uh, and Serbia's relationship with China is really uh, a special case uh, when you look on the entire Balkan region. Uh, with Serbia, you have a country that has a quite uh, quite negative view of, for example, its relationship towards the U.S. Um, uh, due to the uh, past uh, NATO uh, intervention, uh, which obviously is still uh, remembered in the country and acts as a catalyst of uh, positive engagement with uh, with Russia as well as with China. Uh, in any case, these days we see Serbia engaging in a sort of a hedging strategy where it is trying to balance its interests against all four uh, major players in the in the region, uh, that being the EU, US, China, and Russia, and uh, playing them in sort of way against each mm-hmm. other to get the best possible uh, deal out of that. Yeah. So uh, while we've seen, for example, uh, engagement with China on the mask diplomacy and vaccine diplomacy, nevertheless, we've seen recently that Serbia was willing to sign a 5G security memorandum uh, with the U.S. administration, and that mm-hmm. was Trump administration at the time. Uh, so, so, so it's really this kind of a balancing exercise for them. Uh, still, uh, Serbia has been one of the uh, countries that have received the bulk of the attention from, from China from out, out of this entire 17 plus 1 format, which uh, puts together mm-hmm. China with the uh, countries from uh, Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, the investment and the uh, credit uh, flows to Serbia were one of the highest from this entire region. Mm-hmm. And uh, since since China has been uh, investing in these uh, high visibility projects uh, like railways and uh, other types of infrastructure, that obviously creates a very positive uh, image for China. Despite the fact that when you look on the actual numbers, you'll see that, for example, EU uh, pumps it into the country much more money compared to China, uh, and it faces a really big visibility problem in the country. Yeah, this is a big issue that the EU is very careful to point out to me every time I ask them is that they're the biggest funder to to Montenegro, but also to most of the other Balkan nations, both in terms of investment and in trade and and in support um, financially across the board. And I, I wanted to ask you, Matej, we, we've, you know, we on the podcast before we've discussed the 17 point one, plus one and perhaps how it's not monolithic, how each of these countries have their own problems and their own issues and their own relationships and outlooks on China. Um, I guess history has told us as well that, of course, across the Balkan nations, there are very different um, policy uh, opportunities, policy priorities. And generally, I wanted to ask you, do you see a sort of patchwork of attitudes towards China among the Balkan nations as well? Or is there a sort of uniform trend that you can point out there? I'll start maybe with uh, with explaining what what the 17 plus 1 format is a little bit. Um, it's this kind of loose grouping of countries from Central and Eastern Europe uh, that was started in uh, 2012 when you had 16 plus one actually only. Uh, and, and it started with this kind of regular annual summits of uh, prime ministers. Uh, two years ago, Greece has joined the club and uh, since then it's known as, as 17 plus one. But really, if you look on the countries that are present there, you have a mix of EU member countries, non-EU com- countries, countries from the Baltics, from the Visegrad uh, region, and from from the Western Balkans as well. Uh, And these countries actually don't really have that much in common just uh, for the fact that they are all post-communist countries, which uh, makes this format a little bit cumbersome, I think, um, for for all parties involved, including China, because it's very difficult to find any kind of uh, uh, uniting uh, factor that would uh, make it into a more coherent uh, platform. Yeah. So even though it looks like a multilateral platform uh, on the first side, 
uh, when you look deeper into that, it's really a collection of uh, 17 bilateral relations that uh, run yeah. parallel and often uh, compete with each other. Uh, and of course, all these countries have very divergent uh, interests, uh, especially when you compare the those that are members of the EU with those that are not members uh, of the EU, as well as the very different perceptions of China. Uh, and, and the perception has been really changing uh, quite a bit in the past um, three, four years uh, in light of uh, what has been happening in Hong Kong and in light of the pandemic as well. Um, still, if you look, for example, on Serbia, that's one of the few countries where you see that the, the sentiment towards China is still very positive and yeah. uh, really actually improving over the past years. Um, but but overall in the region, you will see mostly the opposite trend. Yeah. Would you put Serbia and Hungary in the same basket? Uh, because obviously I'm reporting this week on EU action on Hong Kong next week, which we're going to see on Monday. Hungary hung, holding it up as usual. Um, is Serbia as far along in its relationship with Hungary or would you say maybe not quite to that extent? Uh, they're somewhat similar, but also there are some uh, some differences actually. So with Hungary, you have a, a government that is obviously very strongly uh, China friendly and yeah. is uh, using the relationship with China also to hedge against the, the EU in these ongoing discussions about the uh, rule of law violations in Hungary which and possible sanctioning by, by, by Brussels. Uh, but when you look into the country on the level of the population, you will see that the Hungarian population is far less enthusiastic about China compared to Serbia, for example. Uh, so, so there you have a, a quite a big difference. Um, also, uh, you know, with Hungary, this uh, this positive engagement with China is really centered on a, a single political party. And uh, in the future, if uh, a political change would occur in Hungary, that might very well lead to also a change in the entire country's position on China. And we've seen that, for example, in Slovakia after the after last year's general election that. Uh, after 15 years of being dominated by the government that was quite China friendly, we see now government that's really wary of China and is looking much more into the potential security risks of that cooperation. And mm. it's quite vocal on the international scene as well when it comes to human rights issues as well. Yes, so, yes. so this issue of domestic political change is really something to look out for in all the countries in the region. All the countries in Europe, I think, well, certainly some of the big ones. We're going to see a big change in Germany, perhaps later in this year as well. Some of the CEE countries as well. We're going to be having to keep a very close eye on this, Matej. So we'll definitely have you back on to discuss as things develop. But for now, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for having me. and It's been a good to chat with you again. Thanks for listening to this week's China Geopolitics podcast with me, Finbar Birmingham. We'll be back here next week with more of the top news from this part of the world. In the meantime, tune in to scmp.com for all the latest headlines. Follow us on Twitter at SCMP Economy. I am at F Birmingham and we'll see you next week. Until then, stay safe, wash your hands, wear your mask, keep your distance. All the best. For more podcasts from the South China Morning Post, head to scmp.com, where you can hear more about technology, trade, culture, and society.